I gotta first let this ad rock here, and then I can skip past it. Okay. You remind me of FeedyX? Oh, I appreciate that. I, I watched FeedyX's shit. He's he's a one of a kind con content creator. I'm not anywhere near his caliber. <laughs> FeedyX is like fucking. He's like in the last three months, he's blown up. I've been watching him since like two months ago. I think I started watching his shit, and he has great content. Uh, but he's great like at analysis shit, and that's. I mean, the guy is super smart too, and really uh, personable too. So. Uh, but I really appreciate you comparing me to him because he's a he's a he's a fucking fantastic content creator. All right, so we're gonna cover this topic real quick here. Uh, for those of you that don't know, this channel that we're gonna be looking at and reacting to is Luke Steffens. He specifically talks about gaming news stuff and like what's going on in the gaming atmosphere. I am very fascinated in keeping track of like gaming politics, and the reason why is because of um, whatever happens, like, I grew up playing PlayStation for almost all of my life. Um, uh, I grew up playing games on the PlayStation 1. My earliest memories go back to, like, Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis in particular. I, I played a lot of Super Nintendo. Um, and um, uh, PlayStation 1 was, a, like, a critical point in my life. A lot of my favorite games of all time are on the PlayStation 1 and on the PlayStation 2. Um, they were, like, critical to my childhood. And one of the things I learned was that there was a, a particular time period when the Xbox re Xbox came out when the console war began. You know, there was, like, Xbox versus PlayStation at a certain point. And for a long time in my life, I always thought, like, oh, PlayStation stand. You know, I'm on the PlayStation side. But... As I got older, especially after the Xbox 360 and how the PlayStation 3 was really a bad product, you know, I was someone that was like, oh, I love the PlayStation 3, but it fucking sucks compared to the Xbox 360. And so I always grew up with this mentality of like, you know, like many other people that struggle with like their favorite standing for their favorite, like, you know, uh, console. And then the PlayStation 4 came out. And I learned a valuable lesson when the PlayStation 4 came out, which is that in many ways, the Xbox 360 made the PlayStation 4 as good as it is. That competition is so important overall for the ecosystem of, of gaming as a whole. So in many ways, the PlayStation 4 would never have been as great as it was without the Xbox 360 kicking its ass as hard as it did. Uh, from the PlayStation 3 days. So, to hear about all these bad news that are going on from the Xbox era is nothing but a negative overall. It's better to have healthy competition for games in general. So, even if you are a person who is an Xbox stan, even if you are someone who is a PlayStation stan, even if you're somebody who is on either camp or just a PC guy, this is bad for gaming in general. No matter what, no matter what, it's bad for the ecosystem as gaming as a whole. So, we're going to check out this guy's channel um, real quick, uh, Luke Steffens, and we're going to see what he has to say real quick. I think I have my captions on, do I not? Let me double check here. I'm per no, I do not. There we go. Hang on a second here. I scooted that up. I got to switch the audio on this thing real quick here. So that way you guys can hear this shit. Um, look at me failing at life already. There we go. Okay, I think you guys can hear this. Let me know if you can hear this. So in case you missed the clip that was going around on, on Twitter, Maddie posted a little segment, a, a snippet of a video that he posted uh, in full. And I'll post the full video into our our chats so if you want to go support him over there anyway anyway but that's in chat if you want to go check out the full video i recommend that you do but i thought that this clip that he posted kind of summarized the the broader sentiment pretty well pretty quickly so just to give you a little deep dive on this um this is maddie's reaction to it and if you don't know maddie somehow at this point he does defining duke which is an xbox specific podcast so he is pretty entrenched in the xbox ecosystem and and xbox happenings 
let's just say um didn't used to be totally committed to xbox but a couple years ago maybe he kind of leaned into that so specialized in xbox stuff uh and and so that's more where he puts his focus uh which is fine which is fine but that should give you kind of a, a context that this is a guy that has been trying to help xbox and rooting for xbox for a while and I think, I think this latest, latest round, round of layoffs, layoffs has, has just, really just really broken a lot of the people that have tried to give them the benefit of the doubt. How do execs who continue to fail at their job continue to make people who make the things they want them to make pay the price? I'm talking about not just Xbox, but I look at Bungie. I look at all these companies where execs are making God awful decisions and the people who make the things are paying the price. Make it make sense at a certain point in time. It's very apparent now that this company is moving toward a multi-platform strategy, leaning into very popular IP from Marvel, from Lucasfilm, from their own portfolio, like Fallout, like Elder Scrolls, but puppeteering the whole thing like it's a part of the big plan. This is what they had laid out for them all along. And I'm not going to advocate for more studio shutdowns, but simply by logic alone, we need to take an honest look at this, okay? We have here Tango Gameworks, who made a phenomenal game that, according to Xbox executives, sold well enough and earned itself a port to other platforms to sell more copies and eventually, I imagine, will be announced to be sold on Nintendo Switch. They get shut down. Okay. Okay, so for those of you who aren't aware of the context of what he is talking about, he is talking about um, recently Xbox recently shut down a bunch of, I think, first-party studios. Uh, that all worked specifically with them partnerships. <clears throat> I think it was four in total. Uh, Tango Gameworks is the one that's most like most explosive in the news article right now. And the reason why is because last year they released a fantastic game. I never played it, uh, but I've heard nothing but great things about it and it won tons of awards. Uh, Hi-Fi Rush is the name of the game. And the company... The, the, the studio that made the game, Tango Gameworks, got shut down this year. Last year, they released a fantastic game, and they still got shut down. They did everything they were supposed to, and they got shut down. That's fucking crazy. That's crazy. The other uh, studios that got shut down are studios that have long legacies and have usually kind of like put out some pretty good games. However, they've had recent controversies with their recent releases. So it's not the most surprising thing that they got shut down, but the fact that Tango did is really surprising. And I'm not sure if it warrants that the other studios that got shut down are a reasonable, uh, you know, reasonable thing for them to do but that's the context but then you have 343 with the halo license who gets to fuck around for not one not two but three times in a row and stumble out the gate with a live service title but yet they come out clean what is the focus here what is the rationale here it makes no sense if you look at their behavior in the past versus now i know 343 got hit with layoffs but by all intents and purposes by xbox's logic with how they approach bethesda here that team should have been fully shut down for being incompetent multiple releases in a row it underlines a consistent mediocrity in xbox and microsoft's ability to identify talent i'm sorry again i'm not advocating for letting 343 go, but they're a phenomenal example of Xbox keeping around the... Yeah, I did see somebody reply to this in the comments of the tweet. Somebody's like, so you're saying they should fire everybody? It's like, no, no, that's not the point. That's not the point, but it is funny if that's... Can you imagine if that was the point? It's like, they should just go scorched earth. Everybody loses their job. Start over. Floundering, failing aspects of their business, just like their execs are currently, at the same time as getting rid of stuff that has a much higher ceiling than what they're currently holding on to. I'm sorry, was it a part of your plan to shadow drop your best game of 2023 and when it didn't get the sales you wanted, you shut the whole team down? Was that your big galaxy brain plan? This is going to give this studio the best chance to survive brilliant fucking brilliant yeah maddie's not maddie's happy, not happy. Maddie's, maddie's not happy and neither are other xbox, xbox focused creators as well you might recognize this individual clobril clobril i don't know how to say it but this guy does coverage based uh, or focused on xbox first party studios across xbox game studios so yeah these are all first party studios then they're all first party studios for the future Maybe less so now. I mean, you can see that there's been previous posts by him 
about how frustrated he is with the Xbox leadership. So why is this so bad? Why is this so bad? Um, it comes down to the major component is this hurts confidence. And confidence, when you're in the marketplace, is a big fucking deal. Take, for example, think about it from this perspective. When you buy something from somebody else, you expect to get what you buy, right? If they give you something else than what you're asking for when you purchase it, then that hurts your confidence. Are you more likely to purchase that product again? No, you're less likely to. That's the same thing when you're working in the, like in a job. You want to know that when you're working at a place, you're going to get paid, right? You're going to get paid. You, you have confidence that they're going to follow through on their word that two weeks from now, you're going to get a fucking paycheck. Well, the problem with this whole situation is Xbox's approach to shutting down these studios just hurt that confidence with their staff. Their team is now realizing even if you do everything right, even if you win awards, even if you sell well, make a profit off the company or off the game, you might still get shut down. So like that's the question at hand is what is Xbox after? What do they want? What are they really after? Even if it like let's say like the the game didn't sell spectacularly well, but it still made a profit. Well, you still made a profit. So what is it that they want? How much of a profit margin do they need to validate it? If that is the case, is anyone really going to be willing to take the risks and working with them going in forward in the future or is everyone just going to go for the easy jobs that are just like straight up cash grab, cash grabs? You know? And that's the big thing about this whole thing is that like when you fire when you let go studios with these with these massive layoffs in this way, it really hurts confidence. And it's also gonna hurt the confidence of the consumers too. Because consumers like these studios because they make good games and they care about them. Now, obviously developers come and go in studios. They they're not there forever. Uh, it's very rare that people stay in there so it could be a different team. Either way, there's someone making a product that they might be interested in, and that's what people are fascinated by, and that's why people are so invested in these companies. Um, it's clear that these decisions that are being made is purely from the leadership end, and that's why people are having such a fit with it. They're getting so pissed off, and this shit is rocking the the industry at large. That's why everyone's talking about it. The reason why, like, this might be some of the worst shit that's happened to Xbox since the Xbox One's announcement. Like, the Xbox One announcement did irreparable damage to the Xbox brand, and now this shit is happening. This this is the last thing that they need. This is very bad. This is very bad for the industry as a whole, too, because it, it's definitely something that people are noticing right now. And all the layoffs and stuff. And uh, just a broader, I mean, this was savage, uh, a broader frustration with the closures that Xbox is responsible for. And I think a lot of people, especially, especially like, like after, after these, these acquisitions these were announced, announced, it was phrased by Phil Spencer, Phil Spencer that they wanted, they wanted to acquire, acquire these studios, studios to give them the freedom, freedom to make to games make. that they wouldn't be able to otherwise make. Or so for those of you that don't recognize what this image is about, these are all the companies that Xbox is responsible for shutting down. These are all first party uh, exclusives that they purchased so that way they could have a, a, a competitive edge against Sony. And they, instead of giving them the first party like environment for them to actually produce what they want, they shut them down instead. They didn't give them the chance to actually produce something because they told them what to make. That's the thing. At the end of the day, it's not the developers that decide what games that they want to make. It's the publishers. They dictate that because they pay them. They partnership with them. So if if Lionhead wants to make, you know, a certain kind of RPG, well, they're going to say, fuck you, too bad. We want a free to play game that people can spend, you know, their money on frequently on. We need to make sure that you have paywalls in there and shit like that. Now, I'm not saying that's what Xbox did to Lionhead. I'm saying that that's how the relationship works currently is that the executives get to dictate what kind of uh envisionment the game is going to be not the developers the developers can try to influence the, uh, the directors they can try to sales pitch them on these things but at the end of the day the publishers get to determine what games that they want or if they had one rough release it wouldn't mean that they would necessarily all lose their jobs because they were backed by microsoft and these were, these were Explanations, explanations and promises, promises basically, basically made, made not just, not to, just the gamers, to the gamers but also to, to the, employees. the employees and there is, and there is basically, basically no way of twisting it now, it now other than that that was a lie that was yes. not true 
and you cannot do that. You cannot lie. Like, here's the thing. You can lie to, like, and I'm not saying it's okay to lie. Definitely making that clear. But you can get away with lying to a consumer. You can get away with lying to an employee. But you cannot get away with lying with both at the same time. You cannot do that. That is a big fucking no-no. Not just in terms of, like, ethics, but it's also a big no-no in terms of, like, straight up, like, uh, like the marketplace. Like, just, like, doing business. It hurts confidence. They bought all these studios with the understanding that they were going to keep some and dump others. others. And And the criteria by which which they determined determined what got to stay and what what had to go go is, in my my view, view, it's pretty pretty clear, clear, and I'll get into that in a minute. minute. Because while I agree, agree, optically, optically, Tango Tango Gameworks, Gameworks, closing them down is is laughably stupid. stupid. It's shocking that they did like it's just just stunning stunning. because it's (laughs) straight straight up last year year, the only only, like really really well received received and and unanimously agreed upon great game game that they dropped dropped, that wasn't wasn't more controversial controversial uh, controversial uh, was was, uh, of course uh, course, hi-fi rush Rush. and And the like like, xbox Xbox leadership i'll talk about how impressed they were how great it was and then they shut them down within a year like it it's crazy a little over a year um I think I know why they closed closed them down. down. It's not like they were just just going totally off 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 the rails rails with it. I think I know why, why and we'll get into that. that. But I still think it was a massive massive blunder. blunder. Like, just because you have one reason to do something, something, but, like, that doesn't doesn't mean that the decision's decision's good because there's 15 other things over here that would make that decision bad that they seemingly did not really consider. But, again, we'll get into all of that. Okay, so that's where we'll end this part of this video for now. Because that's really them just hammering that point over and over and over again. Um, which is how stupid this idea is. Like, to do such a bad business strategy. And it's very clear, this is not done by, like, just Phil Spencer. This is not done by just the head of Xbox. This is done by the executives of Xbox. The people that are in charge of, of logistics and financing. That's their job. And they're they're the ones making this choice, so it's clearly not just one thing; it's a plethora of things. So uh, we'll move on to the next video then, real quick here, which is going to talk about. Here we go. My channel is sponsored by. Yeah. And this one is from. Uh, I think this. Uh, I can I think it's Pierce. I think her name is. Xbox. She, if I remember correctly, is a works at Xbox. As I, I, don't, I think something to do with marketing, of some kind. I don't know. I think she's like a one of those journalists or a, a, something to do with like you know digital and information um, about uh, what is going on in Xbox. I know that she does work at Xbox. So we're going to be talking about like from her perspective, why is Xbox doing these things? What is going on? shut down four game studios this week, including Tango Gameworks, who most recently made Hi-Fi Rush, which in my opinion is the most underrated game of last year. That game is incredible. And Arcane Austin, who are known for making also a bunch of incredible games, obviously a blunder with Redfall, which was their most recent release, but they also made Prey. That game is so good and have worked on Dishonored. Feels weird to say because it's only two games for whatever reason, but probably one of my favorite game franchises ever. They also shut down an extra two studios that I'm not as familiar with. Uh, one of them is Alpha Dog Games, the maker of mobile game Mighty Doom, and Roundhouse Studios, which is being absorbed by the Elder Scrolls Online developers and Max Online Studios. A bunch of extra context here that's important before I get into the things that I feel like I want to say today. Today I wanted to um, go out of my way to like explain some things that I think that maybe gamers haven't, haven't realized, realized yet, yet that, like, that like the industry, industry knows, knows but gamers haven't, haven't realized yet but, but i'll give you a little context, context first so the article, so the article goes on to say microsoft, microsoft currently valued over, over three trillion i can't even fathom, fathom that, that amount of money, money. the way that the i ever try to picture, picture amounts of money, money that are unfathomable to me, to me is like if you pictured each of those dollars as people in a large room how big is the room three trillion i don't that i mean i that's like uh, it, yeah, that that's hard to conceptualize. That's like uh, the size of a fucking country. <laughs> if you try to conceptualize it that, way. I wouldn't do it that way. I would just literally just think about stacking paper in a fucking room. Then it would be like the size of an entire, imp- probably the size of the Empire State Building. Honestly, just literally mal- imagine dollars, dollar bills bundled up together, like in Breaking Bad, 
stockpiled up and fucking Eiffel Tower. That's how much a trillion, like three trillion is. That's a lot of fucking money. They've got money. I have no concept of how big that is. That's too big. The number is too large. They did not say how many staff will lose their jobs, but significant layoffs are inevitable. IGN has asked Bethesda for comment. Microsoft declined to expand further when contacted by IGN. Um, but yeah, obviously, everybody seemingly at Arcane Austin and Tango has lost their jobs. Some of those people, I believe, were folded into other developers. And some people in the actual corporate side at Bethesda were also laid off. Of course, goes without saying, this absolutely sucks. It sucks. Um, this one is especially devastating to me because A, I kind of thought that we were through it. Felt like we hadn't had layoffs in a minute. Um, if you haven't seen my GDC speech, I wrote this very spicy speech for this year's Game Developers Conference. Basically just that. calling out the industry for doing this. And yeah, I have been GDC, hearing a lot of journalists like and a lot of a little more positive, influential like really people are trying to speak like out against it right now. We Which is good. Of it. So A, I didn't very good. expect this and it sucks. And it sounds like from some of the reports that have come out afterwards, this might not be it. There might be more layoffs coming in 2024, which is unfathomable That's the scary because we've part. already had so many layoffs. One of the worst years in the history of the games industry. And before you tell me it's happening to other industries as well, I know that. Whenever I talk about this, people go, this is every industry. I, I get that, but I talk about video games here. I work in the games industry. Like, it's like I'm not saying... Other industries don't also have layoffs. Like, what? Shut up. Yeah, Arcane Studios had to post it. It's just... It's super devastating. For everybody, For everybody, obviously the people affected, affected the worst are the people who have lost their jobs. Their jobs. Um, um, but, what, but what what also, also gets, gets me about this about one, this one is, is if you're going to shut down, down a studio, studio like Tango, Tango, who just made Hi-Fi Hi Rush, Rush, which, which according, according to, to posts, posts from, from leadership, leadership at, at Xbox, Xbox was a success that reviewed that very well, that's, that's now out on multiple platforms. If these two aren't safe, with a three trillion dollar company backing this right them, here nobody is safe nobody in the mm -hmm. games industry is safe no studio you love is safe so why is that so damn important and you know what that means is that i'm like move past the element of it being fucked up and and just shitty that they're shutting down a goof studio if you look at the most important component is that no one was ever going to trust xbox ever again consumer or employee if you did everything right, even by Xbox's standard, they claim it was a success. Even if that's PR talk, they said it was a success. It met their expectations. It exceeded their expectations. It did everything right, and yet they still penalize them. That is the problem. That is the problem. And now, what people understand going forward is that they can't trust working with them no one's in a partnership with them in the future because now the trust has been broken when you did everything right and you still get penalized why would anyone want to work with you why would i like why would if i was a, if i was an employee why, why i would be wondering to myself why am i here what am i doing here like i may be making decent money now but it's it's i'm on a fucking short leash i you're always going to be working with someone looking over your shoulder all the time well, who would want to do that? No one would. No one's going to trust them. This was the worst thing they could have done. And it was the worst thing because they made prior statements that everything was fine. Everyone is at risk of being shut down. And that should terrify you. It terrifies me, not just as somebody who works in the games industry, but as somebody who, like, loves a lot, a lot of these lot game, of studios. game studios. Like, this, this is, is just so fucking sad. sad. Here's what Here's I wanted to talk about. about. Um... um why this, why is, this happening is happening and why it's why only going to get worse. And there's one there's real one big, big point of this that I want to discuss. discuss. I guess two. Hey, maybe, maybe even three. three. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. So, many so many things, things to, say. to say. Mostly, Mostly wow, wow, is this fucking, fucking depressing. depressing. So the first so thing, you will occasionally see a response, see a response of, of if they if just they make just good games, games, this won't happen. Should have just made a good game then. That's what happens when you make Redfall. Should have just made a good fucking video game if you didn't want to get shut down. And I'm going to be frank. That is kind of true. <laughs> There's no other way to put it. If you make a bad product, you are going to get shut down. Now, granted, you 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 might get a a slap on the wrist a couple times, and then you might get shut down. Like Halo, for example, has been making some 
or uh, Halo is not the problem. 343, for example, has been making some pretty bad decisions, and I've heard nothing but negative press revolving around Halo since they've taken charge of it. So it's kind of amazing that they didn't get shut down in many ways. That that one wouldn't have surprised anyone that they would have got fired. As a matter of fact, you know what? If they had fi- shut down them instead of Tango Gangworks, people may have celebrated that instead and said, like, that was the appropriate decision to make. They may have actually faced good PR for that instead. And I'm not out to get out for 343 because I don't play any of their fucking products. I don't care one way or another. But in the optics of things, that would actually make more sense. So that's just something that just, you know, came to my mind right there. But yes, if you make a bad product, it you, you do get shut down. That's kind of the natural consequence of making a bad product. But here's the thing. It's not always the developers that get to decide that. A lot of times the publisher says, we want you to make this, and you don't get a choice. The quality of the video game is irrelevant. The quality of the video game is irrelevant. The quality, the quality of, of the, the game, game is, not is not relevant. relevant. And that is that a thing is that I think, I think like, like gamers, gamers, people who enjoy video, video games, games, myself as a video game, game consumer, should be should a be lot, lot more concerned about than they are. It is time to talk about Fazer, which is a meal delivery service that I've been using for well over a year. Yeah, we're going to skip started using that. When I started that. Bo- which is a thing averages to help you save fuel. This is from, from March, March 5th. 5th. I am sourcing game right here, and it says, says Warner Bros. want to focus on live service games, games instead of one and done titles like Hogwarts Legacy. Legacy. This, this came, came right, right after, after the failure of Suicide Squad and the tremendous tremendous success of Hogwarts Hogwarts Legacy, Legacy. and yet yet they are still still choosing to go live service games games instead of one and done titles. So what that means, and what she's saying is literally, they're comparing two different products. Hogwarts Legacy, that was a huge success, a financial success. They made a lot of money off that. And Suicide Squad, which was was a financial flop, costing them $200 million. They they ate shit for that. They lost so much money on that production. They did all this advertisement for this game, and it still ate shit. And so they have to pick between one of the two. Do we pick the financially successful single player option or do we pick the financially failing option of the, of the uh, uh, live service model? They're picking the live service model. Why are they doing that? And it comes down to there's a shift in the industry that's going on from the executive side of things. Something has changed and it's been changing for a while that were very commercially successful. This is the reason quality doesn't matter, good doesn't matter. Why are they doing this? Why are they making live service games when they just had a huge flop, when Redfall just flopped? Why is there this focus on this thing that is clearly not working when you could instead make something like Hogwarts Legacy, which is a huge IP that a lot of fans enjoyed? The answer is the the reality of the industry that we're in right now and why I think things are going to get so much worse for gamers. Every single AAA game right now is a risk. Making any any game game that is that that expensive expensive to make make is a risk. Making a Hogwarts Hogwarts Legacy, Legacy, huge risk. The reality reality of going live service, service, which which I'm sure we're going to see so much of, instead of going going for more games like Hogwarts Hogwarts Legacy, Legacy, which again, again, you would have considered a success, success, is that it is is less less risky for it to fail. Hey there, game of future alarm here. I feel like I could have phrased this a little more succinctly. Both sides are risks. It's just that one risk has potentially like exponential gain. You know what I mean? It's risky to make a AAA AAA game live service or single player. player. Both are hugely risky. risky. It's just that the risk risk has more of a chance chance of paying off off with like an infinite infinite amount of money if you go live service. service. Does that make sense? Arcane Arcane could could have have made Dishonored 3 and it could have gotten 10 out of 10s and players could have loved it. But if it didn't make an unfathomable amount of money and that's the reality of the That's it right there. That's it. Just profit isn't enough. It has to be year over year profit. These companies have to make more money than they did last year because of capitalism. So just being successful is not enough. So any AAA game that you make that does not have a live service component, that doesn't have built-in battle passes, doesn't have built-in microtransactions, doesn't have an option for a bunch of players who act like whales to spend a whole lot of money and continually support that ecosystem is a huge, huge risk. And I wouldn't say it's a huge risk. The the more appropriate way of phrasing it is the sh- the priorities of the company has changed. They don't care to make a profit anymore. What they care about is making consistent income. That what they want is no longer about making a large amount of money. It's about making sure they keep getting money all the time. They're looking for the consistency of income. They want the microtransactions of the games so that way they can constantly make money over the course of the next 10 years. They care about the long-term investment of making income. 
totally understandable from a perspective of someone that wants to make money. Here's the thing. You are still making money from a single product. <laughs> You're still making a successful story. So what is driving it? It is greed. That is what's driving it. They want so much more than what they're getting. Despite the fact that they get eating really fucking good. <laughs> they're making great money over the fact that they are making great single player games. And people are more than happy to pay for them. They don't care. It's not about making a profit. It's about making a consistent profit all the time. And why do they want that? And that comes down to the factor that each time that they do a quarter, like do their quarterly spiel with their their investors and their their uh, and their um, <clears throat> their other board members, they have to tell them that we made more money than last year, last quarter. And that that has to be the constant thing that happens. Every quarter has to make more money than the previous one. Well, that's their that's their priority. That's what they care about. And that's where the issue of the industry is going right now, is that profits are not enough. It's about making profits hand over fist. It's about making an insane amount of profits. That's what it is. Their expectations are actually unrealistic. I would say not expectations. Their desires are unrealistic. It's not something that's sustainable. It can't be sustainable. Yeah, there are certain games that have been able to pull off, like Fortnite and shit like that, but those are one in a few games that are out there. And guess what? If every video game does it, you're going to get people are going to be less engaged with it over a period of time. It is a better financial bet from these companies that are businesses and see themselves as businesses at this point. They don't see themselves as creative outlets, they don't see themselves as art. Dev teams do. The publishers, the publishers don't. don't. You can have a studio, studio make, make a really, really good, good game, game that is, is a one and done title like a Hogwarts like Legacy, Legacy that people really, really, really like, like, but it's, but it's still, still a random, random risk, risk of if it will take, take off or if people, people will play it or if enough people, people will spend money on it. So it is so a safer bet from a business standpoint to attempt a live service game, which may be cheaper in some ways, might not be in other ways, and to potentially have it blow up and get huge and make a bunch of money from a recurring and dedicated player base than it is to take a AAA single player risk. There's no amount of quality guarantees income to the level of income that they have come to expect. The live service game could fail, but it failing is still a better risk to take than making a AAA single player one and done experience at this point. The quality of the games doesn't matter. Anyone can get laid off and shut down. And why is that so bad? Because guess what? All of your favorite games could be on the chopping block. All of your favorite studios can be on the chopping block. All of the things that you may enjoy could be on the chopping block. And this can reduce the quality of games in the future. You, we could see, and I expect over the course of the next five to ten years, we will see a large increase in like not just free to play games, but like monetary predatory games in the future to start showing up out of the fucking blue that are not fun to play. They're just addicting. They're just not fun to play. They genuinely are unfun, but they're designed in a way to gain you to keep playing them, to game you into playing them. And it's not really a healthy environment to be a part of. Um, and that's the issue with it, is that the design of these things are purely about the idea about making money it's no longer about making fun products so why can that be so bad for us well you you may think that there's plenty of other games in where you can you know invest your time and money into the reality of the situation is that's not always the case a lot of our uh a lot of the stuff that we consume like how many video games do you play that comes from major publishers I'm willing to bet that 80% of the games that you play are not indie games. They're probably owned by a major publisher. So imagine a day where every publisher decides to chase this trend, where they're all doing that. 80% of the games that you'll be playing are not games that you're actually playing. They're just designed in a way to keep you playing longer and more time grinding so that way you ha stay in the game longer to pay for another paywall in some form or another that's gonna happen except for a studio that's making a live service game that is continuously getting profit now we're also in a unique landscape right now that i think has just caught up to these executives touched on this on a stream the other night but 
what you're currently in, in is a time war. This is a very so new thing. I think COVID really kicked this into overdrive. This isn't a games industry thing anymore. This is a entertainment in general thing where they are yes. all warring for your time. Your Xbox is also competing against your Netflix, is competing against your Twitter, is competing against your Instagram for the most amount of time they can get from you. And every single one of these entertainment services is designed to get as much time from you as possible to prevent you from clicking away, to make sure that once you engage, you stay engaged. And that is very difficult for a game that ends in 20 hours. So why is that important for the games industry to do that? Because the longer that you play the game, the higher the probability that you're going to purchase something else, especially if they paywall you. So like if you play the game for, you know, three hours, but they succeed in getting you to play for five hours, that extra two hours increases the risk that you're likely to hit a paywall. And then once you hit that paywall, you may just very well say, fuck it and pay for the paywall. And then every five hours that go by, you're going to hit another paywall. And before long, after 20 hours of playing, you've paid four paywalls in the process. And that company just made hand over fist of money. That's what they're doing. And the the goal for them eventually is to reduce that five hour time span down to one hour so that way every hour that you play you're constantly paying them the service to play their fucking game that's the goal that's what they're doing with this that's where they're going <laughs> that's the objective it is really hard for them to keep you coming back to that same service repeatedly day after day when you and to quantify this, I'm not saying that Xbox is trying to do this. I'm not. I'm not accusing Xbox of trying to, you know, pay, make players pay hourly. I'm saying this is in the games industry thing. This is the 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 objective of every executive out there. That's why you're hearing a lot of language that's being used by executive leaders all across the games industry because their interest is not actually providing great services or a great product it is about stealing i wouldn't say stealing it's not the right word about nickel and diming you for everything that you're worth that's what it is have spare time they want you to be opening up your xbox and looking at the microsoft store seeing things advertised to you or potentially spending money on microtransactions instead of spending time on instagram or tiktok you are in an enormous time war where the most valuable currency that you as a consumer have is your time and you are competing against multi-trillion dollar corporations what does it mean for your time they are doing everything they can throwing every resource at you that they can to consume every second that you have it sucks like i just i don't think this is fixable i think that this is like just just, and yeah, the, yeah appeal the appeal of live service, service spans, spans a lot of facets of the games industry, but it's really that it can steal all of your time all the time. And here's the thing. I'm not opposed to live service games in general. I do think that it isn't a great investment. I think it's a very high risk investment, far more than that of making a great product and then just selling that product, a, a single investment product. I think that this is a higher risk than doing anything else. Uh, because it, more often than not, like if you think about how many free play games that do succeed, there are very few that actually succeed in being like a Fortnite. There's very, very few. And the reason why Fortnite succeeded is because it had happened to manipulate monopolize the market really early on. And then more importantly, expand its influence by adding so much time into their investing into that product. They also have access to the fucking Unreal Engine, so they have access to basically all the assets that everyone's utilizing. <laughs> they have they have a unique monopolization over this particular landscape, so everyone's trying to get a piece of it. It's not likely going to happen unless everyone does it, and then at which point the consumers are the ones that suffer for it. And this is where I wanted to talk about in particular that is a problem, which is this is a massive problem for the future for games. It's not about just gamers getting shittier quality games in the future. Uh, it's also about the prospect that people that will be playing games are less likely to enjoy the games that they play. So what they're likely going to and they're less likely to purchase the games that they want to invest their time into. Um, there are a lot of great games out there that have recently released that are not selling well. And they're not selling well because the market has increased the increased the amount that the games are worth. Like, for example, $60 games are now $70 games. That doesn't sound like a lot. You know, $10 for a $70 game. What they don't realize is that $60 was already a stretch. 
now pushing it to $70 has now made it a luxury item. People now are realizing that games are not just expensive, they're time investments. And because of that, it's really hard to justify the value of $70. That's someone's fucking groceries. That's, that's their whole fucking groceries. If they're paycheck to paycheck, they're going to decide, do I really need this game or can I wait for a deep, deep discount in the future? And that's getting harder and harder in the future because certain games are not dropping in price. Take, for example, Nintendo never drops the prices on their games unless it's a very unique sale. And even then, they don't drop it by a significant margin. It's very rare they drop it to like 50%. So what's happening is that games are becoming a luxury item to the point at where they are pricing out the actual market. This is a very bad thing for the industry as a whole because what's gonna end up happening is that people are gonna stop buying games. And what they're gonna do, they're either gonna go to play to free play games or they're gonna start pirating games. And that hurts everyone involved in general. So that's kind of the reason why like I find this conversation to be really fascinating. And so, you know, as the video goes on, and I, th I think this is a perfect spot for us to stop with her because um this covers specifically um, why it's a problem, and she will mention that, like, w what can you do as a consumer to change that? The best thing you can do is buy the games that you want to support. You know, support the games that you want to support. Spend your money wisely. It, show the market who, where you're going to spend your money on, and that will get these executives to notice. So, the more games like Suicide Squad fail, that that and I'm not saying like I'm not saying that a live service game is the problem. I'm saying that a game like Suicide Squad that is a bad product that fails is going to send a message about like hey, if you're going to if you're going to go down this road, then you better you better make it fucking worthwhile. You better make it a great fucking product. But also you also got to let them know that if you want the same kind of games that you're getting, like Hogwarts Legacy, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, if you still want to get those games, you got to go out and purchase those games and let them know that, um, which is a lot to ask because it is 70 fucking dollars. And that's why I had a big issue with the, the prospect of people defending the idea of let's increase the price range of, you know, $10 more. That's more money in the pockets of the developers. It's not going to the developers. It's going to the CEOs. It's going to the publishers. It's not going into the hardworking people that are working on it that take 3,000, 5,000 people working on it. It's not. It's going into the bonuses of those CEOs. It's not going into the workers. It's not happening. You want to know how that's the, that's the case? Because these CEOs make record bonuses every fucking year. And here's the thing. Why are they incentivized to do that? Because the CEOs are there for only a limited amount of time. Activision has had probably multiple CEOs. Guarantee it. I mean, I know that is the case because they've had multiple CEOs. That company will still be there for as long for a long time still. And they will go through multitude of CEOs. Those CEOs, while they're there, their interest for themselves, their job is to maximize profits, not just for themselves, but also for their shareholders. So their interest is purely based on just making more fucking money for themselves because they're there for 10 years or however long, maybe 20 years. But for as long as that they're there, they're going to make sure that they keep making money hand over fist. They're not there for the interest of the company. They're there for the interest of themselves. That's the truth. That's the real truth behind it. Can compete with a TikTok. They can do something to get you to spend all of your time on it and thus potentially increase the amount of times you will spend money on that. And making a good game is irrelevant. Making a great story that you can play for 15 hours is irrelevant. They want as much of your time as possible. Think about what you do with your time. So a couple of So that's that's the, the, the final gist of this conversation. So let's talk about this. Cause I only seen a little bit of this. Let's take a look here. I've only seen a little bit of this, which is the most recent interview. I think that came out, was it last night? Um, and where the Xbox, uh, I think president, I think her name is Bond, came out and addressed these things. And she said the quiet parts out loud, if I remember correctly. Let's go ahead and check this out. So I haven't seen all of this, so I'm still learning a lot about this, about what's going on. But with the information that I already know, I can already see where we're going right now. 
and it's a big fucking iceberg for consumers and as well as the industry as a whole. Welcome to the stage, Sarah Bond, president of Xbox, of Xbox at, Microsoft, at Microsoft, for a conversation, conversation with Bloomberg's, with Bloomberg's Dina, Bass. Dina Bass. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today. So I want to start talking about the industry in general. Uh, you and Microsoft Games CEO Phil Spencer have been raising kind of the alarm that the video game industry is just not growing and there's a real need to figure out how to reverse that. That is not true. That is straight up not true. The industry has been growing. The thing is, is that the CEOs and the leadership is straight up not fostering growth in general. They're not fostering the growth of not just their companies, but also they do fail to realize that they're pricing out their 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 you know their customer base. The customers are being in, asked to invest more money. Guess what? There's only so much money that's available. Eventually, like the consumers are going to be like, "Well, I don't have enough money to spend on this." What's causing the issue, and and how does how does Xbox turn it around? Yeah, you know, um, the last year or so in video games, largely in the industry, has been flat. Um, and even in 2023, we saw just some tremendous releases, um, tremendously groundbreaking games, but still the, the growth didn't follow all of that. Um, and, you know, a lot of that's related to our need to bring new players in. Um, make gaming more accessible, but all of that has been happening at the same time that the cost associated with making these beautiful AAA blockbuster games is going up, and the time it takes to make them is going up. So right there, I can only tell you that that's not the case, because here's the thing. Hi-Fi Rush, that they recently shut down, made a profit, even a large profit, but just not large enough for them. That's the thing. They wanted more than what Hi-Fi Rush was able to provide them. That's what the that's what really what they're talking about. They wanted to make much more than that, despite the fact that they made a good profit off of it. And that comes down to the fact that the consumers right now are being less involved in the in in the industry as a whole. Consumers are having a harder time justifying the value of purchasing products because the value of them doesn't match up seventy dollars for a you know a six or seven eight hour game ain't worth it in some people's eyes and then you've also got the opposite end of the spectrum where you pay seventy dollars for a new game but it's 120 hours long i don't got 120 hours i got it's only so much time so why not sell games for like forty dollars that are five or six hours long Look at games like Helldivers that made a fucking enormous profit, huge player base. They're making money hand over fist. You want to know why? Because they priced their margin, they priced the value of their game at a reasonable margin that the, that the market can participate in. That's why people, anyone can buy Helldivers because it's 40 fucking dollars. But then you're going to ask people to pay for a $70 game that is, you know, going to be, you know, five, six, seven, 12 hours. People are like, is it really worth $70 then? And people are also going to wonder, do I really have 120 hours on my time schedule? That's what's happening. And so, so much of our focus uh, as Xbox, Xbox is about how we do things to help the industry all up, um, while also ensuring that our brand, you know, everything that we do is there through this moment of transition related to some of the trends you're right so what transition is she talking about the transition that she is talking about right there is covid a lot of people purchased a lot of fucking games during covid because we had a lot of time it changed the industry as a whole people were doing were stuck at home so they needed shit to do so a lot of games were purchased around that time so a lot of a lot of participation happened it's just you know it was a very unusual time it was a blip in the radar um, especially since the whole situation happened when Sony made people make an account to play Helldivers. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll address that in a little bit here. Um, 
obviously there's certain elements like socioeconomics and stuff like that, which I'm not going to get into because it's just a very long conversation to get involved in. Um, uh, there's a lot of additional factors. I'm not saying that this is the only factor, but I'm saying that people are underplaying how big a factor that the price of the products are. $70 is not reasonable. It's not. And it's not me asking for them to reduce the price so that way I can get more games and purchase more games. I'm saying it's hurting the industry. People are being more selective about what they pay. And people are like, well, if you if you have to pay 10 more dollars, then you got more, you know, you got more impressing problems, you know, more important problems in your life to work out. Here's the thing. That is exactly it. People are picking to do other things than play the games and buy the games. So the industry is suffering as a whole. So... It's not just the price of the product. It's a variety of components, but you're adding to it. People already are already selective about $60 games. So why are you making it harder for them to participate in that? That was already a, a roadblock as it is. Identifying, uh, you know, earlier this week. Ex and, and people are saying that like games are taking longer, more, you know, here's the thing. Games have been coming out faster than ever before. There have been more games in a year span of a release than there ever has been. So the release of games has never been the problem. People are willing to wait for a good product. That's not an issue. The real thing that's annoying people and frustrating people is that they're getting products that are not worth their asking price. Like Cyberpunk, for example, when it first released. They're broken, buggy, unfinished games. That'll piss off the market and it hurts confidence. So people are willing to wait if the product is ready. Yeah, they're excited and they're antsy and they'd love to get it sooner rather than later. But they'd rather get a good thing than a bad thing. That's that's what I'm saying. And each year, there's been more game releases than ever before. But there's also been more fucked up games that aren't finished than there ever has been before. So time is not really the issue. So investment into that. Here's the thing. Every game that is successful makes a fucking profit by enormous margins. Elden Ring is a great example of that. Uh, granted, it did come out during, like, you know, at the end of COVID, so a lot of people, you know, had money to buy it. So that is a unique element to it. But at, at the end of the day, what's really going on is that, like, people are just choosing not to participate in the marketplace anymore. Box announced the shuttering of four game studios. I, I know you're not the studio's chief, but how should we, how should gamers understand that move in terms of Microsoft's commitment to developing innovative exclusive games? Yeah, you know, it's, it's always extraordinarily hard when you have to make decisions like that. Um, you know, I'll go back to what I was saying about the industry. And when we looked at those fundamental trends, we feel a deep responsibility. So she said right there, I'll go back to this conversation. So she's dodging the question. She's not going to answer it. To ensure that the games we make, the devices we build, the services that we offer are there um, through moments, even when the industry isn't growing and when you're through a time of transition. And the news we announced earlier this week is, is an outcome of that uh, and our commitment to make sure that the business is healthy for the long term. Uh, but, but that said, our, our commitment to having our own studios and working with partners to have games large and small, you know, we're a platform where you can play GTA, but you can also play Power World, where you can play Call of Duty and you can also play Pentiment, that, that doesn't change. Um, but and, here's, frankly, the, here's the thing that commitment now has been backfired when you just crushed a studio that provided that exact service and did everything that you asked so that it's hard to take that statement seriously. Our commitment to the, to Bethesda and the role that it plays is part of Xbox and everything we do. It's actually been pretty fantastic. I don't know if you've gotten a chance to check it out. Um, the fallout TV show was on Amazon. And it's been great to see people <laughs> fall in love with that universe, but also what it's done for the games themselves and people going back and exploring everything that's inside of that. There's some other great things that are coming from our studios later this year, Indiana Jones and the Great Circle. I was a big indie fan growing up. Uh, looks like you were too. Um, uh, so you should check that out. 
Um, but really uh, but right, right now, now for, for us and our teams, our, teams, our, focus, our focus is on, is on the people impacted um, and um, doing, doing everything, everything that we can do to help them through this hard transition. I think one of the things that was most upsetting both to Xbox gamers and to em employees is that you know one of the shuttered studios in particular just created a hit game, did really well on Game Pass in, in terms of engagement and won a ton of awards. I, shouldn't succeeding in that way ensure the future of, of a studio? You know, one of the things I really love about the games industry is it's a creative art form and it means that the situation and what success is for each game and studio is also really unique like there's no one size fits all to it for us um and so we look at each studio each game team and we look at a whole variety of factors when we're faced with sort of making decisions and, and trade-offs like that uh, but it all comes back to our long-term commitment to the games we create, the devices we build, the services, and ensuring that we're setting ourselves up to be able to deliver. Can I answer the question? Talking, um, you know, further about. Oh, come on, really? Okay. She also didn't press her further right here. She's talking about a totally different subject matter. She like, okay, so she should have pressed her and said, hey, you didn't answer the question. <laughs> she should have pressed her and said, hey, you didn't answer the question. So that that was a non-answer. Growth. I mean, one of the key focus areas for Xbox in terms of growth, and, and this was also one of the key bets in the Activision. Yeah, Activision, she's not. Answer, she's not going to press her. Mobile. Mm -hmm. what, what's the Xbox plan for future mobile gaming, and, and when can we finally see it? Yeah, it, um, yeah it's, it, it feels like it's been a long time since we announced the Activision acquisition, which we completed in October. Uh, and the whole thesis about that, a lot of why we did it was about mobile. And we felt strongly that there has been an opportunity for there to be an experience on mobile that is centered around gamers. Like we talk a lot about how there's three billion gamers in the world. Um, two of those uh, billion play on mobile, and half of those actually play on mobile and they play on another device. But there isn't actually a gaming platform and store experience that is centered around players and those truly across device where who you are, your library, your identity, your rewards, um, that it travels with you versus being locked to a single ecosystem. Um, and we recognize that opportunity for a long time, but we wanted to make sure that anything we built was really grounded in people who play those mobile native games and the creators of them. And so being joined with a team that has real deep expertise in mobile was important to us. Uh, but we are that now. Uh, and so in July, we are gonna be launching our mobile store experience. Uh, we're, uh, gonna we're gonna start, start actually by bringing, by bringing our, our own first party, first -party portfolio, portfolio to that. To that. So you're gonna see games, games like Candy Crush show up in that experience, games like Minecraft. Um, and then we're gonna extend that capability to partners uh, so that they can also take advantage of it and have a true cross-platform gaming centric mobile experience. We're gonna start on the web uh, and we're doing that because that really allows us to have it be an experience that's successful. Oh, I see where they're going with this. All devices, all countries, no matter what. They're talking about streaming. Policies they want to do and, streaming, you know, gaming streaming stores. right now as their main uh, focus. And we're going to extend from there. So I'm just, I'm excited about it just because it's something that we've wanted to do for a long time. We've heard gamers talking about it for a long time. They want people to play video games on their phones. Like, like so playing Halo and streaming it on their phones. That that's what the they want. Do you see Candy Crush and Minecraft in it or how, how soon or... You'll see things roll out over okay. time. Do you know yeah. how soon partners will be able to use it as well? You know, our goal is to get partners using it uh, shortly after launch. We really want to make sure we start and we scale um, using our own IP first. That allows us to make sure that the experience that we bring partners into really builds on all the quality and learning that we have as a team. Another big discussion point in the Activision acquisition was cloud gaming. and. How, how big that market really was. When will we really see it gain traction? Is it gaining users finally in, in any particular regions and scenarios? How, how is it doing? What do people use it for? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, cloud gaming, for those that don't know, I don't know if um, everyone here in the audience is familiar with it, is just the, 
the ability to play a game natively from the cloud. So you don't need to actually have a piece of hardware in your home and you can experience something that's AAA Xbox gaming on any device, regardless of the local compute that you have. Um, and we have been investing in that for some time because we really believe that opening up sort of these beautiful immersive experiences to more gamers is important for industry growth, for, um, for developers, and we know people want to play those experiences. Uh, and we're seeing tremendous growth there. We have more demand than, uh, than supply uh, in that area. Uh, and you'll see What I'm saying is that we don't have the technology right now. Um, people would love to be able to do that, of course. But well, currently the technology is not out. there right now. That's what she's saying. Than the overall market? We were talking about the market yeah, itself yeah. is down. Where, where yeah. is cloud gaming? Where? It is. For, it is growing fast in the overall market, really bringing in new players um, and growth for us. So it's an area where we're investing more and we're excited about. Earlier this year, Xbox announced for the first this, time this that it was bringing just, yeah. a slate of Xbox developed games, Xbox exclusive games, to rival platforms, to Sony's PlayStation and Nintendo Switch. Uh, that obviously was a big change. It was a little bit unsettling for some of the Xbox hardware fans. How is it going so far? Do you have any data about how the games are doing? Do PlayStation gamers really want to play Sea of Thieves? <laughs> You know, it's early days uh, yet, so I don't have specific data to share, but, we're, but we are really encouraged by the reception um, of our games. And one thing that I, you know, I think it's important to note is, you know, as Xbox, we've been putting games on other platforms for a long time. Minecraft is available pretty much universally. Um, you know, the teams at Bethesda have had games on other platforms, the teams at Activision Blizzard Those places have been around at so other, like, they were before they became first-party first exclusives, so, of um, course, as we move forward, Xbox didn't enable them to be multi-platform. Multi -platform. They themselves were available multi-platform um, before mean, they got purchased. At the same time, you know, we've talked about mobile, we've talked mm -hmm. about uh, cloud. I mean, of course, Xbox itself's heritage is in console, and, you know, the energy around the console right now is a little challenge. Many mm -hmm. of the hardcore long-term customers are worried. Um, they're worried about the release on other platforms. They're worried that um, that may indicate that Xbox is defocusing its own hardware. Mm -hmm. what, what, do you, what do you say to them? Um, how do you make them feel like Xbox is still for them? Yeah, I mean, at first, the, the worry that, that I see um, is happening across the industry and I think is a lot of what we're seeing just industry all up but specific to core gamers my focus um, has really been on engineering and building that next generation hardware experience that really really okay what she just said the there right there uh, I talked she's saying we're not interested in the current generation of Xbox we're going to try again with the next generation of them. That's what she just fucking said right there. Experience that really Building the next generation of hardware. Their needs. Uh, I talked about this a little bit publicly a few months ago. I talked about how, you know, our focus is on delivering the biggest leap ever. Um, and that's about really thinking through every aspect of what that hardware and what that experience delivers with the core gamer in mind. And that is about power and performance. That's absolutely part of it. Um, but it's also about the ability to be able to play all of the games. I mean, we, we have people who have been playing on Xbox for decades and invested thousands and thousands of dollars and hours with us and to be able to take all of those games with them into the hardware of the future. Um, so one of the decisions I made when I came in and became president of Xbox was to establish a team dedicated to that, to, to game preservation and ensuring that future generations, future iterations, that you get to take those things with you forward. Um, you know, the next part of that uh, is saying, okay, I get to bring those games with me. Okay, I, I gotta be quite game. frank. I this is a lot of meandering, which tells me that they were not prepared for the bad PR shitstorm that came at them. They probably should have taken more time to think about what the fuck they were going to say before they said it. And honestly, they probably should have sent Phil Spencer out there instead, instead of Sarah Bond. Uh, yeah, her name's Sarah Bond, yeah. Um, I think 
I think she came into this woefully unprepared and this was not thought through. Uh, I think that they just like threw someone to the fucking wolves here because a lot of these things are just straight up neandering and saying non like literally not answers all the time. This is a bad PR. Like this is probably one of the best worst PR stunts I've seen since the Xbox one announcement. Get an incredible high performance experience on my console, but also continuing our commitment to make sure that gamers can bring their games with them wherever they want to play. That my Xbox library is something that. So she's trying to like say that we're not going to make the same mistake that we did with the Xbox one, you know? That can go with me and that I can enjoy with others. So our long term commitment to cross play is part of that. Um, and our commitment to cross progression and cloud saves so you can pick up on one device and you can play on another is part of that. Um, and also our investments in cloud gaming, which you referenced earlier, a lot of those who use cloud gaming are people who own a console. They're just, you know, they want to play it on another device and go somewhere else. So that's the second piece. And then the last piece um, is about Game Pass. We know our core users uh, love Game Pass. Uh, Game Pass is a, a gaming subscription. You get um, a whole portfolio of games, but importantly, you get every single one of our games that we build day one in Game Pass. So here's the thing. When I think about Game Pass, I do think that it might be undermining their exclusivity thing. And I think it's still like a pretty awesome thing. I don't have a subscription to it, but if I was embedded into their ecosystem, I definitely would be because it's probably the most uh, valued uh, system available currently like a value for getting all those game for, games for free is just like awesome like it's a really good value um but i think that that value might be undercutting a little bit of their uh, exclusivities a little bit because imagine like if I, I can only just imagine me like i'd rather just wait for the exclusives to come out later then you know if the exclusives are going to be eventually on the Xbox Game Pass, then why do I, why am I going to get the game day one? Why am I even going to buy the game? You know, um, yeah, you're investing long term into consistently in, in an inconsistent income flow. If that is the case, then um, that's great and all, but you know, is it is that is that really helping the development process? Doesn't seem like it is if you're shutting down five studios or four studios. And the quality and the breadth of those games has only been going up over time, and you're going to see some more really big games uh, going into Game Pass later this year. From Activision's um, uh, across the whole slate, across the whole slate, you're going to see some really amazing things. Um, and keeping that as something that is really special for Xbox players is central for us. A lot of the focus at this this conference today has been AI, um, and but. AI for gamers is a little different that we talk about AI for the enterprise or for yeah. healthcare. I, where do you think AI will be important both to, to players and to game developers? And how is Microsoft investing against that? Yeah. Um, I didn't hear all the talks uh, today, uh, but I think we can all confidently say that we are right at the beginning of what AI means for us as a society um, and for businesses in general. And that's absolutely true in gaming as well. Um, in, you know, for us, we take our responsibility around AI. It's another fucking non-answer. She doesn't know. Seriously, and being really, really thoughtful about what we do. I think she came into this and not prepared to Xbox, say anything at all. Uh, you know, there's something really unique about being a gaming company that is part of a major AI company. Um, and so all of our focus within our team is about how we ensure that gaming AI is really crafted in a way that delivers unique and delightful experiences to players um, and adds real value for developers. So there's three things we look at as part of that. Uh, the first is around developer velocity. How do we give developers tools to make it easier for them to realize their creations, to speed up iteration cycles, and also, frankly, to make it easier for people who may not have as much in-depth training on game development to build a game. Um, we know that with that, there's just going to be a huge proliferation of gaming content and options out there. So that leads us very naturally to the next layer where we're investing a lot, which is around discovery. 
and making sure that people can really be the fuck does that mean for the consumer <laughs> that they'll love and that a whole range of creations can be discovered from the biggest games but also from something novel and new that you may not have intuitively known to look for but you're gonna love if you experience it and then the last piece is around the actual experience in the game um engagement delight um you know playing through and having a fun time not getting stuck all the things that come with that uh so that you can get really the most out of the game experience so we are early in this as i said it's, it's hard to take that state that part that last part of that statement seriously when you just released a critically acclaimed game that people everyone that's played the game has said is very good and then you punish the studio by shutting them down and you're letting the studio that everyone is criticizing 343 to be still there you didn't shut them down that's hard to take that seriously it's a contradiction we'll see us share things and things will come out during the course of the year but our focus just really continues to be on keeping player at the center, keeping the developer at the center, and how AI turns up Great. in gaming. Xbox President Sarah Bond, thank you so All much right. for your time. <laughs> I'm gonna be quite frank too. This uh, this reporter, didn't, this journalist did not do a very good job. She was coached. This was coached. This is why people are little sussy wussy about what's been going on in the games industry as a whole right now because she did not do her job she should have been pressing her a lot harder and hitting her with a lot more difficult questions and if she does if sarah's not giving her a straight answer she should have been asking the same question again or at least saying like okay i'm not really thinking that you're an answering the question is my understanding that you're not going to answer the question you know really come at it hard because i think that you're giving me a non-answer it doesn't sound like a real answer Am, is it my understanding that you won't answer this question? Come at them, man. Like, that is why people don't trust this whole thing. This is why there's so much negativity around it. So, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's a bad look. It's a very bad look. <laughs> <laughs> ah.